is Marilyn Grace, and I'm president of Storyteller Productions, and I've been working on finding out if Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid died in Bolivia or if they came back to the United States, and I spent 22 years. I have two books on Amazon, and I'm here today with Brent Ashworth, and Brent is a collector, and he has all these Butch Cassidy items. He has everything on all historical figures, so I want to introduce you to Brent Ashworth. Hey, Brent. It's nice to be here with you, Marilyn, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Butch Cassidy uh, in Bolivia and then uh, afterwards. So, <clears throat> got some good documentation on him and his life. Most of it uh, begins with the Percy Seabird scrapbook. Uh, Percy Creek Seabird was uh, the uh, mine foreman. Uh, this is uh, down at the Concordia Tin Mines. There's a photograph of him here. And in later life, uh, he was uh, interviewed by uh, James D. Horan, uh, the Western author, uh, for uh, a number of his uh, books. And so on, this particular book is called uh, The Outlaws, the Authentic Wild West. There's a picture of uh, Seabird in his old years, uh, before he passed away in the 1960s. This picture was taken in 1961. And uh, it was, uh, was Seabird that uh, received uh, a couple of letters from uh, Butch Cassidy. Uh, the last known letters that we have uh, before he disappears, uh, before the, uh, the famous shootout, uh, which took place in, uh, on um, uh, November 4th of 1908. Uh, and this is the Seabird Scrapbook, which is an interesting, interesting book in and of itself. Uh, the scrapbook is, is really just the U.S. Department of Agriculture book, which uh, Seabird uh, paper being expensive and so on, just decided to start pasting things in from his life down in South America, mostly in, in this book. Uh, he was a, a businessman uh, who traveled quite extensively, but he did spend the years uh, when uh, Butch and Sundance were down at the Concordia tin mines, uh, working as uh, hired by Siebert to be uh, um, mining uh, guards for the payroll, which is kind of ironic, because <laughs> uh, of course they've been hitting payrolls and dead lighter uh, down in, uh, uh, in Bolivia. Uh, they first left uh, the United States after having their picture taken, uh, we call it the, the Fort Worth Five, uh, down in Fort Worth, uh, Texas. Uh, and it was uh, following the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, robbery in Nevada that uh, they uh, did, and they uh, decided to uh, get uh, new suits and to dress up uh, in the Fort Worth Five uh, picture and decide to uh, uh, send a note back to the uh, the bank saying thanks for the contribution. Well, of course that Fort Worth Five picture was uh, shown to all the law enforcement people in the United States and abroad and uh, that made it so it was too hot for them to stay in the United States. So along with uh, uh, Sundance's girlfriend at, at a place they uh, took off for uh, from New York for uh, South America. They ended up down in Argentina originally and then they went to Chile for a short bit and then ended up in Bolivia. And it was during the Bolivian years that they resumed their uh, outlaw career uh, by knocking over payrolls and banks and things like that. Um, and it was also during that time that uh, they made friends with uh, uh, the man that hired them, Percy Siebert, who was uh, originally an American that went down there to work uh, uh, in the mining business and so on, which was quite Pro prolific big mining operation and a number of uh, other American outlaws were also down there at the time we know that but uh, the uh, Seabird kept a scrapbook uh, from uh, about the time he first went, went down there around 1900 uh, until um, uh, until after the, the shootout about 1910 or so and it was during that time that he uh, made friends with uh, with Butch and Sundance he knew of their uh, robbery background, and he made them promise that they'd never knock over his payroll, which, as far as we know, they never did. Uh, they stuck with their word. Um, but in the course of time, uh, they did a little traveling, uh, and uh, two letters were received by Seabird, which he pasted into his, uh, into his scrapbook, uh, and they were noted on the outside of the second letter uh, that uh, these were letters uh, and I, I wanted to show you these because they, they're quite interesting because they were actually pasted in that book. That's a, that's a page there from the scrapbook right there. 
So uh, the page was loose, and I took, took it out of the scrapbook when I acquired it. Uh, the scrapbook has an interesting history because James D. Horan, the uh, historian, uh, first is the first one we know that ran into it uh, when he uh, made friends with Siebert back in the uh, around 1960-61 before his death. And uh, the scrapbook was given to a family member. It went to uh, a Mrs. Robert W. Klein in Williamsport, Maryland. Then a friend of mine, who I'll just call Craig, because he didn't want his uh, uh, his identity known, uh, purchased it, uh, and I purchased it from him. So it has a, a pretty uh, direct trail on the way back. But uh, more importantly, uh, the two letters were picked up by uh, author Larry Pointer, among others, in a book he entitled In Search of Butch Cassidy, which came out in 1979. And it was, uh, it was in that book that he first uh, wrote about these letters. Maybe I can just read you the text and then I'll show you the letters. Um, at this point, I'm quoting from uh, Larry Pointer's book, page 208. Uh, Cassidy tells of Edda's departure. Betty Price, who was her uh, name, uh, undercover name, returned to Buenos Aires as the hardship uh, would be too much for her. Maxwell, which was one of the uh, uh, names that Butch went by at the time, J.P. Maxwell, gave Betty all his money as they figured it would be that last their last meeting on this earth. At a place also as conspicuously absent in Cassidy's next documentary whereabouts on November 12, 1907, when he wrote, quote, to the boys at Concordia from Santa Cruz, Bolivia, some 400 miles to the east on the Bolivian Plains. And this is the letter uh, he's writing it to uh, Percy Siebert and to the boys at Concordia. He says, we arrived here about three weeks ago after a very pleasant journey and found just the place I have been looking for for 20 years. And Ingersoll, speaking of uh, at the time the name that was given to uh, Sundance, likes it better than I do. He says he won't try to live anywhere else. This is a town of 18,000 and 14,000 are females and some of them are birds, meaning uh, prostitutes, fallen doves. Uh, this is the only place for old fellows like myself. Cassie would have been 41 then. Uh, one never gets too old if he has blue eyes and a red face and looks capable of making a blue-eyed baby boy. Uh, obviously, this is not a letter you read in, in church. Um, but he goes on, oh, and then he uses God's name. If I could uh, call back 20 years, and have red hair with this complexion of mine, I would be happy. I've got into the 400 set as deep as I can go. The lady feeds me on fine wines, and she is the prettiest little thing i ever seen. But I'm afraid Papa's going to tear my playhouse down, where he is getting nasty. Uh, but there is plenty more. This place isn't what we expected at all. There isn't any cattle here. They were trying to continue with their cattle business. They had several... Uh, hundred heads, some sources said they had over a thousand head of cattle between them when they were trying to go, go straight. Um, and uh, uh, the place isn't what we expect at all. There aren't any cattle here. All the beef that is killed here comes from Moyo, a distance of 80 leagues, and are worth from 80 to 100 uh, BS or Brazilian dollars. Um, but uh, cattle do very well here, and grass is good, but water is scarce. There isn't any water in this town. Uh, when there is a dry spell for a week. The people here in town have to buy water at $1.80 per barrel, but they can get good water at 40 feet, but are too lazy to sink wells. And he goes on to talk about uh, some of the uh, things that they're running into at that point. And then he says, we expect to be back in Concordia in about a month. Good luck to all the fellows, J.P. Maxwell. Well, he writes that letter. It's a long three-page letter I'll show you in a minute. And, uh, and then later on, Cassidy's last letter addressed to C.R. Glass. Uh, C.R. Glass who was the, uh, the mine owner, uh, kind of uh, Siebert's boss, if you would. Uh, and uh, evidently in the pause at the time was written February 16, 1908, from the Concordia mine at uh, Tres Cruces. And uh, he says, uh, this is Butch's handwriting again, Scarberry, speaking of George Scarberry, manager of a mine near the Concordia, Leaves here for Sika, Sika on the 18th. He will be there the 20th. I don't know how long he will be there, but I will let you know when he leaves. Everything is okay here as far as I know. Yours truly, Gilly. Well, uh, that's kind of interesting because Gilly's was his mother's maiden name, and as far as we know, this is the last uh, undercover name that he used. Um, 
I'm quoting again Larry Pointer, the J.P. Maxwell alias was Cassidy's most frequently used name during his association with the boys at Concordia. Gilly was an unknown Cassidy alias, alias until the discovery of this letter, although the bandit's mother's maiden name was Gilly's, remarkably similar. The handwriting is the same as that in other Cassidy correspondence. This second letter is the last documented evidence of Butch Cassidy's presence in South America. And a number of other books and articles have picked up on these. Uh, they're, they're very well-known letters. The, uh, the letter from, uh, to the boys of Concordia from Santa Cruz, uh, I hold in my hand. This is the, the original of that. Again, the last page. Uh, just wanted to show you that these were, these were taken out of that uh, scrapbook. Uh, this scrapbook right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Out of Seaver's scrapbook, which you can see a lot of the pages are, are loose in it. Um, and uh, he puts in all, all kinds of articles and letters, and, and uh, he has uh, various uh, different businesses that he was involved with and uh, business cards that he puts in here, uh, Percy Siebert. And then this is the, the letter to the boys at Concordia, uh, which is a three-page letter. Um, I read you the juicy first part of it in the end, but it's all about business, basically, and, and uh, running their, their uh, cattle business. Uh, uh, which they were attempting to, to go straight on at the time. And, and then the, uh, the second letter, which was with it, and uh, in the scrapbook, uh, these were all uh, together, uh, has a note in Percy Siebert's handwriting at the top, letters received from Cassidy or Maxwell. And it's right at the, the top of the letter. Um, so we know both these letters, their handwriting's identical, uh, were uh, Butch Cassidy's, and as Larry Pointer points out, this is the very last known evidence of Cassidy being in Bolivia. We don't have any other letters that, that uh, come later than this in Bolivia. And it's written at Tres Cruces, February 16, 1908, to C.R. Glass, the, the mining uh, owner there. And, uh, and I've read you the text of the letter, but it's signed Gillies. What's, what's the month? Uh, this was dated in uh, February, February 16, 1908. Uh, the famous shootout that they've, uh, Chapman and others said that uh, they had uh, been killed in was not till November 4th, so this is uh, the same year as they uh, disappeared in uh, South America. And uh, there's uh, a lot of question about uh, Percy Siebert. These came from his scrapbook, like I say, but more importantly is, well, uh, why would Percy Siebert, who was brought in to identify their bodies, because he, uh, he knew what they looked, for, looked like, and he evidently identified these two bodies from the shootout, on November 4th um, as being uh, bodies of Butch and Sundance. Why would he misidentify them? And uh, a, a good uh, response to that is found in uh, Butch Cassidy, My Brother by Lula Parker Bettinson. Um, she did this book with Brigham Young University uh, and uh, told her story to Dora Flack, who was a, uh, a famous uh, uh, LDS uh, Mormon uh, genealogist and researcher. And uh, I'm just quoting from uh, page 184 where she talks about Butch making a visit back from South America to their home with uh, his father and her uh, present. Now, she had not met her older brother. She'd heard about him and some criticism of her uh, eyewitness that uh, he came back is, uh, is based on the fact that uh, she wouldn't have known him because uh, he was already, you know, out and about as an outlaw uh, before she was uh, born. But the dad was around, his dad was around, he certainly would know, and, um, and he is quoted by, by her and Butch here. Uh, they had a conversation uh, that uh, he overheard, she overheard and wrote about uh, in giving her book to Dora Flack. Um, any rate, he says, uh, just what did happen, dad asks. I don't really know myself. I heard they got Percy Siebert from the Concordia Tin Mines. Now, this would be Butch telling his dad and sister what had happened and family. I heard they got Percy Siebert from the Concordia Tin Mines to identify a couple of bodies as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, all right. I wonder why Mr. Siebert did that. Then it dawned on me that he would know this was the only way we could go straight. I'd been close to Siebert. We talked a lot, and I knew how sick of the life, he knew how sick of the life I was in that I was. He knew I'd be hounded as long as I lived. Well, I'm sure he saw this as a way for me to bury my past along with somebody else's body so I could start over. I'd saved this and Mr. Glass's lives on a couple of occasions, and I guess he figured this was how he could pay me back. 
Funny thing, Ma always used to say, a friend in need is a friend indeed. Uh, I guess uh, you could say some of your mother's uh, bread cast on the water came back to you, Dad said. And uh, so that was that part of the conversation about Percy Siebert. But his name comes up uh, pretty directly because he evidently misidentified their bodies after they were shown to him uh, when he was brought in to identify them after the famous shootout down in, uh, in Bolivia in 1908. Um, and, of course, uh, we believe he had a full, uh, full life after that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know if there's any more on that you want You'll, to. Uh, I'll just, let me just, yeah. again, why don't we go ahead and cut there and 